Welcome to the Explore the Bible Sunday School Lesson for July the 3rd, 2022. Today's lesson is entitled, Return, and is taken from 1 Kings chapter 15. One of the things that we have recently uh, seen in the world has been the Platinum Jubilee for Queen Elizabeth II of England. Uh, there was a lot of coverage of it, even here in the in the colonies. In fact, uh, there was so much interest in it, you would think we were still colonies of that country. But one of the things that was brought to our attention during this time in the different articles and uh, TV programs that were broadcast about this is that Queen Elizabeth II was a lady of great faith. Her relationship to the Lord was important to her. Uh, even from the very beginning of her reign, uh, she spent uh, time uh, giving credit to the Lord and seeking his guidance. In fact, uh, very quietly, she would attend church on a regular basis, uh, there to be sure that she got an opportunity to worship the Lord. And once she declared, it was said, uh, she quote, to quote her, it's, she said, for me, the teachings of Christ and my own personal accountability before God provide a framework in which I try to live my life, end quote. So she was very clear from the beginning that she put her relationship to the Lord and how she was living and would be accountable to him as the guidestone for her life. We can see this in other leaders. We can look back in the history of our nation and see when we had leaders of America that were men and women of God the difference it made. Now, some of us, not just looking in history, but in our own lifetime, we, we see the difference of people who believe in the Lord and follow the Lord and those who simply give lip service as any politician might. And when there, we have people that are uh, men and women of faith leading us, the nation prospers. And when we have people who reject God and God's ways, we see how the nation suffers. The same thing was true in the nations of Israel and Judah. And this is what we're going to be looking at today. An opportunity that the nation had after some leaders that rejected God to have a leader who would bring them back to God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word and for the truths that are there and for the uh, eternal nature of these truths that when we follow you, uh, we're blessed. And when we reject you, we're not. I pray, Father, that you would help us as a nation uh, know leaders that would put you first in their lives and make serving you their priority. Thank you, Father, for giving that type of leadership. And we pray that we'd be willing to accept it. Uh, Father, guide us today as we study your word, for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our text today is going to focus on two major characters. Uh, there is uh, Basha. Uh, he is the, or Baasha, uh, who is the king of Israel. Uh, this is the northern kingdom. Baasha began as a general in the army and rose to such uh, power that he actually overthrew the king killed him. Uh, Nadab was the king at that time. He was the son of Jeroboam. Uh, and Basha uh, killed him and those that were uh, a part of the royal family and assumed the role of the king of the nation. The other individual is Asa. Asa is the king over uh, Judah, the southern kingdom. He was the grandson of Jeroboam, the son of Abijam, uh, and he assumed the throne at the uh, death of his father, Abijan. And he led the people in a time of renewal, in a time of return to the Lord, and a time of uh, rededicating the land and consecrating the land, cleansing the land of the foreign worship that was there. Uh, these two men, for a part of their uh, reigns, were contemporaries. And during that time, they really clashed with one another uh, just over the various things, such as the geography, where the uh, border would be, uh, who controlled what, but also over their basic philosophies of a worldview. 
One was for himself. One was for the Lord. The one thing we see about Asa is that he was wholeheartedly a one who wanted to follow God. In 1 Kings chapter 15, we read beginning in verse 9. In the 20th year of Israel's king Jeroboam, Asa became king of Judah. And he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. His grandmother's name was Maaka, daughter of Abishalom. Asa did what was right in the Lord's sight, as his ancestor David had done. He banished the male cult prostitutes from the land and removed all of the idols that his father had made. He also removed his grandmother, Maaka, from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. Asa chopped down her obscene image and burned it in the Kidron Valley. The high places were not taken away, but Asa wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his entire life. He brought his father's consecrated gifts and his own consecrated gifts into the Lord's temple, silver, gold, and utensils. So here we see uh, this transition of power. And one of the things that we can be really grateful for is that the writer of Kings uh, really gave us a sound, uh, solid, uh, you know, chronology of who was king when and how their uh, reigns overlapped with one another. Jeroboam was still uh, king uh, when Rehoboam's grandson uh, assumed the throne. So uh, Jeroboam had been through uh, three of the kings of Judah as he ruled over Israel. Asa has become king, and he's going to reign for 41 years. Uh, Stop and think about this. This is a reign that is equivalent to the reign of the first three kings, David, uh, Solomon, and, of course, Saul at the beginning. Each had a 40-year reign. Asa had a 41-year reign. So right there, very much contemporaries. One other thing that is identified here is that uh, his grandmother, Asa's grandmother, was Maaka. Uh, and I think it's important that she is identified there. Um, the key phrase uh, to remember Asa, the th- phrase that you want to uh, put with him is you seek to remember these men, is that, quote, he did what was right in the Lord's sight, end quote. That's not said of all of the kings of Judah. Some did, some didn't. It's not said of any of the kings of Israel. Uh, the, the tagline for each of them is that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And this was a change because they had been through some times when the men were not leading them toward God. Rehoboam uh, did not. His son uh, did not. Uh, Asa did. And he didn't do it just verbally. Uh, This wasn't just paying lip service to the things of the Lord. He was really serious about this. In fact, he tried to undo the wickedness that was in the land. Uh, Several things are mentioned here. He he banished the male cult prostitutes. Uh, In the Canaanite worship, uh, the fertility gods were very much uh, honored and sought after. Uh, Even though they were false gods, they were followed. And there was sexual activity as a part of the worship of these. Uh, And there were the cult prostitutes who were part of these worship services. Uh, This was not only a violation of the fact that the Lord God is the only God. It is a violation of the direct command that is found in Deuteronomy 23, uh, 17, which forbid this type of practice in a worship service. No Israelite was to be a cult prostitute prostitute, and they were not to use prostitution uh, to increase the temple treasury, the temple funds. This was not to be a part of the worship of the Lord God. So he banished these uh, individuals, and then he removed the idols. Um, You know, both Solomon and and Rehoboam had placed these idols and shrines throughout the nation. Uh, Well, Asa came in, and he removed them. Uh, He tried to get rid of all of that influence that was there in the land, removing the temptations that was there. 
And then he did something that was really uh, unexpected, uh, but shows how wholeheartedly he was following the Lord, is that he removed his grandmother, Maaka. Now, she was the widow of Rehoboam, and uh, she still had a position in the court, uh, in the uh, palace hierarchy. She had an important place. She would be something perhaps like the, the queen mum. She was the um, a leader that was there. And the position that she held, she had promoted the worship of Asheroth. Now this was, again, a fertility goddess, a Canaanite fertility goddess. Um, and the image that she had of this individual is described as being obscene. Uh, we do know that uh, the female characteristics were exaggerated on a lot of these idols that the archaeologists have uncovered. The word in the Hebrew that is translated here is uh, obscene, could also be uh, translated as horrid. It's a horrid thing. Or it could also be translated as a thing which makes one shudder. In other words, just looking at it would make a person of faith shudder at what was going on there. Uh, so you had these uh, these carved images. Uh, in other places, they would simply st stick a pole in the ground and they would come and worship around that pole that was uh, standing there erect in the middle of the field. And this would be part of their worship services and he would cut those things down and burn the pieces that were there. All of these things he was doing uh, to clear the land. The one thing he did not do that is mentioned here is that he did not level the high places. Uh, this would be the probably the mounds that were built up where they brought in loads of dirt and stone and, and built a high place to have a shrine to a false idol. Uh, he left the hills, uh, but he took away the idols. Yet in all of these things, he did right. In fact, the defining phrase is, that and from the scriptures is Asa was wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord all his life. That would be a good epithet, would it not? That he was wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord all his life. Now, understand this was an all tearing down and getting rid and cleansing. He did tear down these places. He did uh, try to remove these things, but he also did things that lifted up the worship of the Lord. He wasn't just tearing down the idols, he was promoting the worship of the true Lord. And one way he did this is by bringing the consecrated gifts uh, to the temple. He increased the temple treasury with gold and silver and, and utensils, which is probably utensils made out of that gold and that silver. He brought these things there. And these things were consecrated unto the Lord or set apart for the Lord. Um, and it mentions here in the scripture that he was doing this both with his own consecrated gifts and the consecrated gifts of his father. Which makes me think that, by the way, the word father here could mean immediate father, or it could have mean an ancestor. It leads me to see that uh, there may have been some gifts that were meant for the temple but never made it to the temple. Uh, they were uh, sort of delayed in delivery and were used for personal purposes instead of being taken straight to the treasury of the temple. And uh, some of his fathers were still hanging around in the palace, uh, maybe in the palace treasury. And when Asa saw this, he uh, had them taken to the temple treasury where they were originally intended to be set apart for the use of the Lord. Uh, we can see something like that today. I remember being at a, in a revival services with an individual from Munford, uh, Tennessee. And we were driving through the community, going to the church one night, and we, as we passed by one of the houses, he pointed to a large boat that was there beside the house. He said, that boat is the Lord's boat. And I thought, well, this must be a good story here. Is this something that uh, the family has bought and they use it for youth outings or maybe for church outings? They take... Uh, Sunday school classes out on their boat. And, and I asked him about that. I said, is this what this is all about? And he said, no, it's the Lord's boat because they bought it with the Lord's tithe. 
Well, sometimes the Lord's gifts do get sidetracked for our own use. Asa brought all that that had been consecrated to the temple to the Lord into the temple treasury. He sought to do right by the Lord. It's a good example here, I think, of how a child who is not raised by the most godly of parents, uh, and we use that term uh, kindly, uh, is able to still be a child of God. Our faith stands on our own. We stand as individuals before the Lord. While Asa did not have the best home life as a child, as an adult, he followed the Lord God of his own choice. He was what God wanted him to be. Asa and Baasha often had conflicts. And once there's a conflict where he is actually cornered. As we look in verses 16 through 19, we see one of those situations. He says, There was war between Asa and King Baasha of Israel throughout their reigns. Israel's king Baasha went to war against Judah. He built Ramah in order to keep anyone from leaving or coming to King Asa of Judah. So Asa withdrew all the silver and gold that remained in the treasuries of the Lord's temple and the treasuries of the royal palace and gave it to his servants. Then King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, son of Tabririam, son of Hezron, king of Aram, who lived in Damascus, saying, There is a treaty between me and you, between my father and your father. Look, I have sent you a gift of silver and gold. Go and break your treaty with King Baasha of Israel so that he will withdraw from me. So here they are. The kingdoms are at war. And Baasha decides that he is going to uh, enlarge his kingdom southward. And he builds a, a fortress at Ramah. Uh, he is in, expanding the city of Ramah uh, to make it sort of a, uh, a headquarters to blockade the trade routes that would come into uh, the, the land of Judah. Uh, this is uh, Ramah. It was the hometown of Samuel. It's where he was buried. And it was a major uh, crossroads where the north, south, and east, west trade routes would cross. And by building up that city there and stationing individuals there, uh, troops there, he could keep people from going south and carrying goods into Judah, uh, starving them out. He could keep communication lines closed through there cutting off all this contact. It was a common military move. Well, Asa did not like this, as you can well imagine. And in response to that, he went back to the temple and to the temple treasury and took all the gold and silver out of it. But fair to say, he also took it out of the royal palaces. And with all this pile of, of gold and silver, he gave that to his servants uh, to go to Ben-Hadad uh, in Amron, living in the city of Damascus. Now, when it says his servants here, understand that, that he is talking about his trusted officials, uh, those who were in his court, uh, these who would be diplomats um, and in a uh, mission with uh, security and a mission with secrecy. Uh, they slipped through uh, to go to the north, uh, east of Israel to the land of Amron where Ben-Hadad is. Now, he is king there. Uh, he is one who is a neighbor to Baasha uh, to the northeastern side. Um, he is uh, confronted with these individuals who is coming to him and they mention a treaty that exists between the fathers. Now, this could be uh, any number of treaties. The fact that uh, the making of this treaty is not recorded in the scriptures is, is not significant. Not every act of the government was recorded there. Um, it could have been a treaty that was assigned as uh, Solomon took one of his princess brides from, uh, that, from the land of Amron, from Damascus perhaps itself. But whether this treaty existed or this was just a a ruse for getting him to agree to this. The point of the matter is, is that 
he was paid, Ben-Hadad was paid uh, to be an ally for the southern kingdom of Judah and for King Asa. And uh, this with the gold and silver was something that appealed to Ben-Hadad and he was willing to do this and take it over. So he sides with Asa. He uh, begins to attack uh, uh, Baasha's uh, kingdom there, uh, going into these cities. Um, so this is what is, is happening there. Now, let me just say real quickly that um, this was not the best act on the part of Asa. In fact, in the parallel passages in Second uh, Chronicles, uh, this taking place in the 16th chapter, we read there that uh, there was a seer by the name of Hanani, and he confronted Asa for this alliance. And he said this treaty indicated a lack of faith in God. Uh, Asa, you are placing your faith in Ben-Hadad instead of putting your faith in the Lord God. And as a result of this, uh, Asa, your reign is going to be marked with wars, he said. Uh, you are uh, seeking political help instead of spiritual help, and this political help is going to result in war after war. Um, Asa, instead of seeking forgiveness for what he had done and coming back to the Lord and seeking forgiveness from the Lord for what he's done, he has Asa thrown into prison. Uh, excuse me, he has Hananiah thrown into prison. Asa rejects him. Uh, today we talk about when people shoot the messenger uh, because they don't like the message. Well, that's, this is really what he did here. Asa didn't like the message of Hananiah, and so he threw him into the prison. But here this has taken place. Uh, this uh, alliance has been created, and Ben-Hadad has been paid for his help. And so here we see uh, this leads to the resolving of this conflict here. In verse 20, it says, But Hadad listened to King Asa and sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel. He attacked Eon, Dan, Abel Beth Machaca, all Chineath, and the whole land of Naphtali. When Baasha heard about it, he quit building Ramah and stayed in Terzah. When King Asa gave a command to everyone without exception in Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah and the timbers of Baasha had built with it. Then King Asa built Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah with them. So it, this is uh, one of those passages with a lot of interesting pronunciations in it. But the gist of the story is, is that Ben-Hadad took the money and true to his commitment, he began to attack the nation of Israel. He began to go into the towns and villages, and the location of these cities, as you would look at them on a map, shows a general uh, and slow incursion into the land. So beginning with the cities that are closest to Damascus and closest to his territory, he begins to move into uh, the land of Israel, particularly in the tribal area of Naphtali. Well, when the word of this reaches Baasha, he uh, has to leave and go defend that side of his uh, territory, the northern part of his territory, uh, because really this puts him in sort of a pincher position with forces on the south and forces on the north, and he has to divide his uh, troops in order to protect the city. Uh, the, the First Kings doesn't really uh, tell us how this uh, came about how that works itself out. Uh, that's not important to the story as far as the writer is concerned. He's more concerned in, with Judah and the southern uh, conflict. But uh, there had to be some resolution uh, between Baasha and Ben Hadad over that northern excursion, incursion into his territory. In order to take care of that, he withdrew his troops and quit building Rama. In other words, that project was put on hold while he went to defend his nation from the north. Um, when this happened and the people pulled out, Asa, uh, aware of it because he would have scouts out watching, 
commanded everyone in Jerusalem. Uh, the Bible is clear. He commanded everyone with no exception. Uh, the whole city population was to go to Ramah. And they were to take all of the stones uh, that had been cut and brought there to uh, continue to enlarge the city, to build the city. And the timbers that had been cut and brought in to be a part of the buildings and the infrastructure that was there. And they took them away. Uh, tore down what had been built and carried away this building material so they would not be there to uh, reconstruct with. And in fact, they actually took them and used them to build up Geba and Mizpah uh, in the tribal area of Benjamin. Uh, so they did not go to waste. That was good stewardship. Uh, but it really stopped this incursion uh, by, by Asha. Here we see, I think, a good example of the fact that the frailty of humans uh, can be met with the grace of God. Uh, Ben-Hadad was a man who was after God's own heart, who sought to follow the Lord wholeheartedly. And yet, he still made mistakes. There were still times when he trusted in those that were uh, human in nature. In fact, uh, he not only trusted in Ben-Hadad, we learned that later in life, uh, about a couple of years before he died, he developed a foot disease, a foot problem, and this a foot problem continued to grow. But the Bible says instead of seeking after the Lord's help, he sought the physician's help. Even with this, he still was seeking to follow God. He did right in the eyes of the Lord, verse 11 tells us. And what an encouragement this is to us to know that we can do right in the eyes of the Lord even when we occasionally uh, mess up or maybe more than occasionally. God is there to forgive, to welcome us back, and to give us the blessings that we need in our lives. He is good for us in doing that. I think the lesson from here today is, is that our nation prospers when the leaders are godly. And we need to seek godly leaders. And the lesson is we need to be as faithful to God as we can be as we seek to follow him. Now let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the lesson that is here today and the truths that are presented. And I pray that you would help us to be faithful servants of yours, following you as we should. I pray, Father, for our church leaders, that whether they're standing in the pulpit proclaiming your word or speaking in small groups or to individuals, that they would be the godly leaders that they ought to be, that we would be able to follow men and women who serve you and love you. And Father, may you bless us as we do that, for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Next week, we'll continue our look through the book of 1 Kings. We'll be in 1 Kings chapter 18 in a lesson that is entitled, Proven. I look forward to seeing you next lesson.